scientific notation, and significant figures. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at a couple of common ways we treat numbers in general chemistry. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. This lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these weekly throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. In addition to helping you prep for your high school and college science courses, we also provide DAT, MCAT, and OAT admissions prep at chadsprep.com. All right, so we're going to start with scientific notation here. And scientific notation is just a, a really convenient way of writing either very large or very small numbers. And that's something we run into quite commonly in general chemistry. So when you're dealing with like the size of an atom being like a fraction of a nanometer, that's a really small fraction of a meter. Uh, you're dealing with really small numbers. Or because they're so small, if you're dealing with the size of a sample that you know fits in the palm of your hand, you've got such a huge number of either atoms or molecules there that you're going to be dealing with very large numbers. And writing really really small and really large numbers can be a pain in the butt, but we can make it much simpler with scientific notation. The way this works, so we'll start with a large number here, and we've got a decimal that's not written, that's essentially right there, and in this case we're going to move that till we've got just one number left of the decimal place. Now, we can write a number in scientific notation with more than one number left of the decimal place, but that's not proper. Properly, it should be written with just a single digit left of that decimal, and so we'll rewrite this here as 4.72. So, and then we moved it one, two, three, four, five places. So in this case, that's gonna be times 10 to the fifth power. The way this works is when you've got large numbers, numbers that are much larger than one, you're going to end up with positive powers of 10. But we'll see over here when we've got numbers that are smaller than one, we're going to end up with negative powers of 10. So for this one here, we're going to move the decimal now to the right instead, one, two, three places. And this is going to become 7.349. And notice we've got just one digit left of the decimal, as is proper for scientific notation, and then times 10 to the power of, and in this case it's going to be negative 3. We moved it three places, but again for a number that's much less than 1, it should be a negative power of 10. So, and these are equivalent expressions for the same number as are these two right here. And so, a couple different ways you can look at it. One, again, if you got a number much bigger than 1, positive powers of 10. Number much smaller than 1, negative powers of 10. So, other way to look at this is if you're taking this number, and if you're making this number smaller, notice we went from 472,000 to now a coefficient of 4.72, so then you better have a very large power of 10 to make it, uh, to make up for it. So, because it's got to be the same number. So, if your number part gets smaller, your power of 10 better get bigger. Same thing over here. In this case, we made a very small number, 0 0.007349, get bigger to 7.349. And so if the number gets bigger, your power of 10 better get smaller in this case. Cool, this is as much of scientific notation as I want to cover right now. Uh, but basically, I wanted to give an introduction first because this is going to be helpful when we start talking about significant figures. So now we've got to talk about significant figures, or sig figs for short. And uh, significant figures, a lot of students uh, memorize the processes of, of how we determine how many sig figs and how we do certain mathematical operations, but they never kind of understand why we're even doing this. And, but significant figures deal with how well do we really know a number? How precisely do we really know a number? And so let's say we take a look here, and I'm right here in Phoenix, Arizona. And let's say I've got my friend up here in Portland, Maine. So, and somebody asked me, hey, how far is it to your friend up in Portland, Maine? And I say, well, you know, it's about, it's 3,000 miles. So, and in this case, like, you know, that's a pretty rounded number. You know, is it exactly 3,000 miles, like to the, you know, to the T? Or, or is it like, you know, give or take? Well, you know, if I had to round it to the nearest thousand, it'd be about 3,000 miles. That's a better approximation than 2,000 or 4,000. So, and that's kind of the deal, but it's not, you know, not that exact in this case. And so in this case, you know, with significant figures, we often look at zeros as not being significant uh, as the case may be. And so this would have one significant figure in the thousands place and be, you know, uh, as precise as it is to plus or minus a thousand, so to speak. All right, so what if I said, actually, it's like 2,700 miles? Well, this makes a big difference, you know, in, in a lot of vehicles, this would be the difference between a, a full tank of gas and getting there or something like this. So all of a sudden now I've got a, a more precise number and it's got significant figures now 
in both the thousands and the hundreds place. And so now this number would actually be considered to be precise, like plus or minus a hundred. So maybe that's where we go. And we take this a step further and actually go and say, hey, it's actually 20, uh, 2,740 miles to my friend's house in Portland, Maine. Okay. So looking at that now, and all of a sudden now we've got significant figures in the thousands, hundreds, and tens place. So, and again, that zero is not going to be significant, it turns out. But the way we look at this is now it is exact or precise all the way to plus or minus 10 miles. So much more precise now. And finally, if, if I take this, you know, to the absurd extent, and I go, it's 2,739.1 miles. And all of a sudden now I've got a very precise number relative to the numbers I've given before. And it's precise all the way to the tenths place on the other side of the decimal. So we'd say this has five significant figures. And now all of a sudden it's just a much more precise number number. And this is important. You know, if you're dealing with the sciences or engineering or something like that, and say you're building a bridge. So, and you start using, you know, rounded approximations on setting up, uh, you know, some of the supports on your bridge. And, you know, because you're rounding to such a great extent, maybe your bridge is not as strong as you think it is or something like this. And so this is where the significant figures become important. It's how well do you really know your numbers? And when you start doing calculations with them, there's way of ways of propagating these significant figures so that you know how much of whatever you should be doing or how much of whatever you should be adding. So when it comes to chemistry and stuff like this. So, but this really is important for science and engineering. So for you in your general chemistry course, you're just going to need to know how, uh, you know, how to process, you know, determine how many sig figs and how to do, uh, say, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and stuff like this. So, but this really does have real world importance, although that might get lost on you in your course. Uh, however, this is something you do need to know. It is commonly uh, questions on your first round of exams and stuff like this. Uh, and it's also really important in the laboratory. Most professors and instructors are going to really ding you on sig figs if you're not doing it properly uh, in the laboratory. So, all right, so let's take a closer look here at sig figs. All right, so the first thing we gotta deal with with significant figures are the zeros. So uh, any numbers that are non-zero are gonna be significant, and the pesky little things are the zeros. Sometimes they're significant, and sometimes they're not. And we've got some rules for this. And uh, So the first rule is if your number starts off with zeros, those zeros are never significant. So here we've got 0 0.00047, and the number starts off with all zeros. So and in this case, those zeros are not significant. And as a result, this first number only has two significant figures, the four and the seven. So it's got a significant figure here in the one. So the notice this is the tenths, hundredths, thousandths in the ten thousandths place and the hundred thousandths place. That's where the significant figures are. So any zeros at the beginning of a number, never significant. Now notice like this next number 40, 5,400, we'll deal with that in a second. So. But let's say I had 5,400 and I just put a couple zeros on the front of it. Well, we'd never do that. But if we did, they wouldn't be significant either. So I just want to point out that zeros at the beginning of a number, it doesn't matter where, you know, which side of the decimal place they are on, are not going to be significant. And in one case, we wouldn't even write them. So, and the reason that becomes important is because now zeros at the end of a number, sometimes they're significant and sometimes they're not. And so it turns out when you end a number in zeros, so, but it's to the left hand of the decimal and often the decimal wouldn't even be written. Notice there's an imaginary decimal right there. So those zeros are not gonna be significant either. And so here, we've also only got two significant figures. These zeros are not significant in this case. And that's gonna be different than what we see in the next example because if you end a number in zeros but it's to the right hand side of the decimal, those zeros are going to be important. And so not only are the, the two, the five, and the four significant, but these two zeros are significant as well. And this is a way of saying saying that, you know, we know this number really, really well. So 2.5400, it's really precise how well we know this number to the right of the decimal here. But this is like, you know, it's about 5,400 miles, give or take 100 and stuff like this. So however, what if it really was like 5,400 miles to the nearest mile? And, it, and you actually meant it. Like you, you look it up on Google and it was exactly 5,400 to the nearest mile. Well, the way we might show that in such a case to show that it's significant, there's really two ways. We might put a line across the top of that zero, which is going to show that it's significant. That might be one way to do it. So, and that gets to be a little bit of a pain in the butt. So, however, 
Another way to pull this off is to use scientific notation. So if we really did mean 5,400 exactly all the way to plus or minus one mile here, all the way to the single digits place here, then what we could do is convert this to scientific notation and make it 5.400 times 10. In this case, we moved it one, two, three, 10 to the third, and it's a positive power 10 because we're dealing with a number that's bigger than one. And in this case, notice now these zeros are to the right of the decimal. And if you end a number in zeros right of the decimal, they're significant. And so now we have our four sig figs. And so what's nice about scientific notation is that, you know, all of your uh, zeros and stuff like that are always going to be significant because if you're in proper scientific notation, you have to have a number left of the decimal, not zero. So you can't even start a number with zeros like we did right here. And if you ever do have zeros, they're always going to be right of the decimal. So they're always going to be significant. So that's one thing that's nice about scientific notation is all of your numbers are always significant. Now, the last rule dealing with zeros is that zeros in the middle of the number are always significant. And so in this case, what I really should properly say is that zeros that are surrounded by significant figures, so that two is significant, the one and the six are significant, and zeros that are in between other significant figures are themselves significant. So in this case, we'd have five significant figures in 200.16. Cool, and those are your rules. So again, zeros at the beginning of a number, never significant. Zeros at the end are significant if they're right of the decimal, not significant if it's left of the decimal, and then zeros in the middle of your number, surrounded by significant figures, are also significant. So that's your rules for zeros. And you gotta be able to kind of identify when zeros are and are not significant. But you've also got to be able to do some basic mathematical operations. You've got to be able to do multiplication and division, which is by far the most common mathematical process you'll do in general chemistry. But you might also have to do a little bit of addition and subtraction. And, and it turns out, so for propagating like number of sig figs and stuff, there's rules for logs and other mathematical processes that just aren't going to probably come up in your general chemistry course. So, but multiplication, subtract, I'm sorry, multiplication, division for sure, and addition, subtraction probably. And so we're going to cover those here next. So we're going to start with multiplication and division. And, and in general chemistry, that's by far the most common operation you're going to do and have to determine significant figures for. And it's the easier of the two as well. And so the way this works, in every term you're multiplying and dividing, if all you're doing is multiplying and dividing a big string of numbers, then you can do this all at once at the end. You don't have to do it every step along the way. And so in this case, I've just got two numbers. But what if I was multiplying like four numbers in a row? Well, then you just count how many sig figs you had in each number. I'm going to do that here. So this first one's got three sig figs. The second one's got four sig figs. So, and it turns out that your answer, if all you're doing is multiplying and dividing, can't be more precise than your least precise number, so to speak. And so in this case, your whichever of your numbers has the lowest number of sig figs, your answer can only have that number of sig figs. So here, one of my numbers has got three sig figs, one's got four, my answer's only gonna be able to have three sig figs. And if we work this out, we're gonna get 17.97. And so I'm going to carry this to four sig figs. So, but then I'm going to take this last one right here and use it to round the one right before it so that we end up with a final answer and only three sig figs. And in this case, that seven is going to cause us to round up. And in this case, that's going to take this to 18.0. And that zero ends the number right hand side of the decimal. So it is significant. And we've now got three sig figs there in 18.0. And that would be the answer here in the proper number of sig figs. And the idea is that, you know, if you're multiplying a string of numbers, and if you know some of them very well, very precisely with lots of sig figs, but one of them is really much more approximate. Well, again, you can only be as exact as your least exact or least precise number. That's kind of the way it works. And we'll see the uh, a similar fashion when we're doing addition and subtraction here. Now, you're going to do addition and subtraction much less commonly. Um, but it is going to show up every once in a while and because it shows up so uncommonly, a lot of students forget there's even a, pro a different process and they try to do the same thing they do for multiplication division. But with an addition and subtraction, the way this works, so I'd recommend adding these up kind of the way you did back in grade school. So line them up a little bit differently. So we're going to have 1,540 plus 327.4 plus 0 0.267. And so if you look at these numbers, so th this one 
your most exact digit here is this seven all the way down here in the thousandths place. And so we know this number plus or minus one one thousandth. So for this one, it's all the way to the tenths place. We know this number plus or minus one tenth. So, and then 1540 here is only exact. It's most precise significant figures. That four, that zero is not a significant figure. And so in this case, it's in the tens place. And so it's only exact or precise to plus or minus 10. And so it turns out your final answer when you add all these together can't be more precise than your least precise digit. So in the way, actually I've got it right on the sheet there. In this case, I say the answer is round to the same decimal place as the most precise decimal place in the least precise term. And so in this case, this is the least precise term and it's most precise decimal places in the tens place. And so in this case, we're gonna have to round whatever this comes out to, to the tens place with addition and subtraction. So it's not about counting how many sig figs. This has got three and this has got four and this has got three. So we should have three sig figs. It's not how it works. It's actually, you have to look at how precise each individual number is and the least precise number, that's as precise as your final answer can be. And so if we work this out now, so 1540 plus 327.4 plus 0 0.267 equals 1867.7 And truth be told, I didn't actually have to carry it any farther than right here because I need to use this digit to round it to the tens place. And so in this case, this is gonna round to 1,870. The seven means we round up. And there's our correct answer. And notice it just happens to have three sig figs, but it's not because we needed to make sure it had three sig figs. It's exactly where it's at because we needed to make sure that the most precise significant figure was in the tens place based on the numbers that were given. Okay, now this is, the last part here is gonna show up much less commonly than any of the rest. And here we've got both multiplication and division and addition and subtraction. And you've actually gotta propagate your, your proper number of sig figs all along the way. And so you wanna follow your order of operations here and stuff like this. And notice we're gonna to have to add these before we actually divide the sum of those two by 0.5. And when we add these, we're then gonna to have to adjust the number of sig figs. And then when we divide by the bottom number, we'll then go have to go further and adjust the number of sig figs yet again. And so, oh, and I lost a zero. There's a zero on your handout. So I lost a zero right there. That way we got two sig figs in that number, not just one. All right, so 4.23 plus 7.6 is 11.83. So problem is, is that here, I haven't adjusted my sig figs to take into account the numbers we have. And when addition and subtraction, I can see that this first number is significant all the way to the hundredths place, but the second number is only significant to the tenths place. And so I'm gonna have to round it to the tenths place. And I'll use the number right after. In this case, being a three, I'm just gonna keep it as a 0.8. I'm gonna round down here. So we can essentially just get rid of that three to get it now only significant to that tenths place. And now we've gotta do the process of division. And so we'll take 11.8 divided by 0.5 and get 23.6. And in this case, with doing multiplication division, in this case, typically division, now it's all about the number of sig figs. In the numerator, I've got three significant figures. In the denominator, I've only got two. And so my final answer should only actually have two sig figs. And so we want to round it here at the three, and so that six is gonna cause it to round up, and so the actual final answer here is 24. Like I said, you know, having to do both addition, subtraction, and multiplication division in the same problem doesn't show up too often, but it does have a chance of showing up right here in this first chapter. Now, one thing to note about sig figs is that with sig figs, we're gonna make a real big point of it in this chapter and on the exam uh, for this section. However, much of the rest of the semester, it is not gonna be the biggest deal, sort of. And what I mean by that is that you're probably not gonna have a bunch of multiple choice answers after this test anyways, uh, and maybe not until your final exam anyways as well. But on you know second, third, and fourth exam, you're probably not gonna have a bunch of multiple choice answers that you know, have just the same answer expressed in a different number of sig figs. That's not usually how it works. So 
It's not going to have the same level of importance the rest of the semester, at least not until the final exam, as it does on this first test. But once again, don't forget that in the laboratory, sig figs is typically a pretty big deal for most professors and instructors. So uh, even though it's not going to get a, a huge focus in the course uh, uh, after this first exam, keep in mind it's still got a huge focus in the lab. All right, we're going to finish this lesson off with a really brief discussion of precision versus accuracy. And uh, this is important because precision and accuracy in the everyday vernacular, we kind of use them interchangeably. So, but in the sciences and engineering, they actually have uh, s similar related meanings, but they are distinct and you definitely need to know the difference. And so it turns out precision is not what you'd think. A lot of people think that, again, in everyday life, we treat precision as if it's just the same thing as accuracy. And let's talk about accuracy first. Accuracy is how close to the true value you are. That's it. So, but precision is different. It's not about being right, so to speak, uh, but it's, it, it goes more to, to the repeatability of a measurement, if you will. And it's how close multiple different independent measurements are to each other, not to the true value. That's what precision deals with. And again, it, it gets down to the repeatability of it. So, and again, in chemistry, we're probably going to, you know, get this in the context of measuring the weight of something or measuring the volume of something or something along those lines. But it's often really convenient to look at uh, a diagram of a bullseye here uh, for the way this works. And so if I was testing out a, a new bow and arrow, so, and if I shot four shots and they all were right in the bullseye right there, well, one, we'd say that in this case, this bow was very accurate because I was hitting the, the place where I was hoping to hit, right in the bullseye. But we'd also say it's very precise because all four of the arrows are close together. We'd call this a good grouping in archery. So this would be both precise and accurate. Now, on the other hand, if I tried out that same bow, and unfortunately, instead of hitting the bullseye in the middle here, I hit four arrows right here. Well, that's still a rather close grouping. So, but maybe, you know, maybe the sight on the, uh, on the bow is off or something like this, because even though it was very repeatable, which makes it very precise, it was not very accurate because I didn't come close to the bullseye. And so this would be an example of something that's very precise, but not accurate. And then finally here, I'm just all over the board. I'm not close to the bullseye, but none of the, the arrows are particularly close to each other. And so this is neither precise nor accurate. Cool. So hopefully this demonstrates well that difference between precision and accuracy. And once again, accuracy is how close you are to that true value, but precision is how close the values are to each other, but not necessarily uh, to that true value. They can be close to that true value, but they don't have to be close to that true value. They can still be precise in either case. Now, if you found this lesson helpful and think other students would benefit from seeing it as well, consider giving me a like and a share. Best thing you can do to make sure it gets as wide an audience as possible. And if you've got questions involving either sig figs or scientific notation or precision versus accuracy, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Happy studying.